If you return with me to a very familiar passage, Philippians, third chapter. And I'm actually going to read the first 14 verses for you. Just so as we stay in within context for a while. Philippians chapter 3, reading verses 1 through 14. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evil doers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcised, or the circumcision, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection, and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And may the Lord adds, add his blessing to the reading of his word for our hearts as we receive it. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this hour of this day. We pray right now for a special anointing on your manservant, that the word from my mouth and meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. Open the ears of the hearers, that they will not only be hearers, but will also be doers of your word. In your name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. I subtitled this, Keep the Press. I'm focusing on the 14th verse, and the 14th verse says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And I focus on the word press because there's a whole lot to understand from that word. Press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. Isn't that awesome? Yes. To press, according to one definition, is to act upon 
through steady pushing or thrusting force exerted in contact to press involves some pushing. And I remember years ago, uh, Brother Reed from California, the known late, Brother Benjamin Reed, was one who uh, was a pioneer of PUSH, and the acronym was PRAYER until something happens. I kind of feel like that pressing and pushing are interrelated. And so today I want to talk to you about this, that it's said that in every marathon, every runner who finishes the race, I don't know how true it is, but it's been reported and I'm repeating it. So if it's not true, forgive the one who told the lie at first. Uh, but it's said that every marathon runner who finishes the race has had several crashing points throughout this 26 and a half mile journey. Because when you prepare for a marathon, the most you run is 12 miles. So nobody runs 26 and a half miles so that on the day of the marathon, they can run another 26 and a half miles. It is so grueling to your body that the trainers only go just about half the distance in preparing for the race. And so mile 13 becomes the first crashing point for many of the runners because your body has never done 13 miles before. And now you've reached a crashing point where your body is telling you you, why are you up here? Why are you in this race? Why are you moving? Why don't you just go home? Or why don't you do like the lady who won the, 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 the race by taking a, a, a different path, catching a bus to mile 25, and then running home for the last mile? I mean, that seems to make more sense than to push your body through mile 13 and mile 18 and mile 22 all the way to 26 and a half miles. Well, our journey for the Lord is a marathon. We are not running the 100 meter dash where we can see the take where we take off. We're not running the 200 meter or any other smaller race because this race is going to take all that we have and more to make it to the end. But we are assured that we will make it to the end. That's the good news. God has promised us that if we are faithful, we will endure to the end. You know, so, so we have the promise, but we've got to run. And what happens to us is along the way, we're doing so well. As a matter of fact, along the way, people are talking about you. They're talking about all the things that they've heard about you, uh, the things you've said, the things you've done. Uh, the church is praising you, lifting you up, and giving you all sorts of awards. Uh, but then there comes a crashing point. Then there comes a time in your life, maybe when you lose a loved one, or maybe when you lose hope because the same church that built you up is now tearing you down. Because the same people that should have known better are the first ones to criticize you. And you've reached a crashing point. And many do crash. When all around my life gives way, some people just give up. But the songwriter says, that is all my hope and stay. But you have to be on that solid ground, that rock of Jesus, in order to withstand each and every crashing point. I want to encourage you today that the Word of God says that in this passage that we press on toward the goal. I think of the story of, of Job, and Job 
had many points in which he could have given up. And I believe that all of us would have sympathized with Job at any of those crashing points where he loses his family, then he loses his friends, and then his wife tells him, why are you in this race? Why are you still running this race? Why don't you just curse God and get it over with? And he could have said, okay, my love, I'm going to curse God, I'm going to die. Just make sure you bury me in such, such a place. But no, he rebuked her and he said she's talking like a crazy woman. And then he went on in chapter 90 to say, I know that my Redeemer lives. How can you come to such a repose in a time of suffering? Because Job did not stop suffering when he says, I know my Redeemer lives. He was still in the middle of the suffering and he still had a lot more. And he says, even though my flesh will fail me, yet, yet I will serve you. Yet I will be faithful to you. It's because we must have some inner strength that tells us the race is not for the swift, nor is the battle for the strong. We have to have something else within us, actually something that's greater than us, who comes in us and who elevates us so that we can rise up in the midst of turmoil and trouble. So that, so that when life circumstances come your way, you're able to say, I'm not going to focus on life. I'm not going to focus on this stuff that's just pulling me down. But I'm going to look to Jesus, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of my faith. And so we need to have something grounded in us. We need to have some, some, some inertia in us that will say, I'm going to press on. In the book of Mark, we read about this woman who, in the King James Version, says she had an issue of blood. Meaning that she was hemorrhaging continuously. And this woman heard of Jesus, and in spite of her crashing points, she, the Bible says, pushed through the crowd. Now you have to imagine this, that this is a frail woman. She has been hemorrhaging for weeks, not days, weeks. And she's come to the point where she says, I am going to reach out to Jesus because I believe that he is my savior. Because I believe that he can heal me. Because I believe that he is the one, the only one that I can depend on. I've spent all my money. The doctors have taken it all and they're still telling me they don't know what's wrong. You know, doctors today don't always know the answer. And any answer they give, not always the right answer. Sometimes they're honest enough to tell you, I don't know. I think that's the best thing a doctor can ever tell you. I know we don't want to hear it, but I think it's better for them to tell me, I don't know what's going on, and I don't know how to fix it, good luck. I'd rather that than they can tell me, go and take this other test and take another test and spend all my money and in the end say, I still don't know. And if they don't know, then obviously they can't help you. Our same Mother Washington, I believe it's about 20, ooh, 05, I think it was. We believe that that she was unconscious for about 12 hours or more. Because the last call that anybody remember talking to her was in the afternoon and, and they didn't find her until the next morning, mid-morning. And you know, she had put a roast or something in the oven and it burnt to crisp, it was gone. Uh, and, and the Lord kept her safe in that apartment because it didn't catch a fire. It didn't smoke so that she would, would not be able to breathe and have issues. And the Lord just kept her. The persistence of the saints got 
the, the management to let them in and they got in and they found her and she went to the doctors and the doctors said, there is nothing we can do. She's been under too long, nothing we can do. We give you some medicine, take her home, bring the family together, say your goodbyes. And I just saw that she's turned 96. I don't know, that should excite you. Because that's 14 years ago that she was given up for dead. But the saints didn't stop praying. See, we have this thing among us that we will push, we will pray until something happens. That in the midst of our crises, in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of not knowing where to go, we will keep praying and praying. We will push, we will press, we will reach, we will not give up or give in. And, and because of the saints' prayers and, and because of the grace of God, our sister joined us in service not long afterwards and has been able to attend until most recently when she's now homebound. Yeah. And she's 96 years old. So that means she was in her 80s when this happened. Yeah. Isn't God great? Yeah. I know this church gets so quiet when you hear of the goodness of God. I, I, I think when you hear of the goodness of God, you should be so excited that I can't go on to my next point. But you're like, get on with it, Pastor. Let's get over with it. I know you've got three points, so you've got one more left. Let's get home. You know, the church is running fast today. We're going to get home early. But I'm saying God is encouraging us to press, to push, yes. to apply pressure, to, to, as it says here, to act upon through Steady pushing. Yes. Yes. Not intermittent pushing. Steady pushing. This woman steadily pushed through the crowd to the point where she was down on her knees. And she says, if I can only reach the hem of his garment. And so through a crowd that wasn't forgiven or caring, she made it to Jesus and barely touched the hem of his garment. Yes. But the word of God says immediately Jesus perceived virtue, the healing power that went out of his body. Could you imagine? You've got to think about this. Jesus did not heal this woman. Her faith healed her. See, so you can think about the pastor laying on hands, slaying you, doing all that stuff. But this woman didn't get to Jesus who turned to her and said, daughter, you be made whole. This woman just reached out through all of life's circumstances and found virtue in just touching the hem of his garment. Sometimes we have got to push and push and push if we could only touch the hem of his garment. What I'm encouraging in High Street is, yes, our numbers go down and down and down. We've got seven in the 90s, so 10 years from now, seven will be gone. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. If you made it to 90 today, I don't expect you to be around the next 15 years. You might be. You could defy me. That's praise the Lord. I'll be here to testify for you. But I know that God is not done with High Street. I know that we've got to keep pushing and pressing on. I know that we've got to reach out and press on to that goal for the calling that is in Christ. This is not time to give up. This is, it may look like a quitting point, but this is not time for us to give up or to give in. And Jesus is my third example. In the 22nd chapter of Luke, Jesus finds himself in this garden of Gethsemane. And here he reaches a crashing point. He reaches a point where humanity was trying to take over divinity. 
And in his humanity, he says, Lord, if there's any way possible, remove this cup. But thanks be to God that he didn't crash. He didn't give up. He didn't say, you know, I've taken so much for these people. I've done this, I've done that, I've done the next. Lord, that's, that, that's the, this plan of yours wasn't all that great because I'm the one bearing all the pain. Let me go back home. But he says, no, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And because he pushed through a crashing point, because he didn't give up when it was convenient to give up, we know that he went all the way to Calvary and he paid the greatest price of all time so that all of us who love the Lord, who believe in him, would not perish but have everlasting life. So that John 3.16 can be realized, Jesus paid it all. Jesus laid on that cross and took all the sins of the world. That is the world before he was alive on earth, the world while he was alive on earth, and the world after he has ascended back to heaven. Everyone's sins were cast on Jesus. Could you imagine? Jesus never met you and your sins were on him. And he says, not my will but your will be done. He gave up his life. He didn't quit. Went all the way to Calvary for you and for me. That's why Paul can say that he doesn't want the righteousness that's found, that comes from the law, which he had. You know, Paul was right in the sense that he was everything that the religious people said you should be. He was not just a Jew, but he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He knew the law, and he was so much into the law that he persecuted the saints, and he was the best persecutor of all times. Until that day on Damascus, that road to Damascus, where the Lord stopped him dead in his tracks. And asked him, why are you persecuting me? And that day, Paul went from being the persecutor of the saints to the champion of the saints. He is the 13th apostle who has been preaching the gospel of Christ. So he went from trying to destroy the church to building the church. Amen. That's because he had learned then that I have to keep pressing and that's why he's come through this experience and he's talking to the church at Philippi and he can tell them, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I do not consider that I am exempt from more pressure. But one thing I do, I'm going to first forget what's behind. You know, a lot of problems is that we refuse to forget what's behind. And a lot of you don't let us forget what's behind. Because when we do make a stride forward, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so decides to remind you, don't forget what you used to be. You know, when, when John Mark turned away, even Paul was reminding him, don't forget, you left me so you can't join my band again. It took a while before Brother Barnabas could meet up with Brother Paul and remind Brother Paul that Brother Paul was once not on this road either. He was once a persecutor of this same thing that he's preaching. And so the reconciliation came to the point that Paul wrote and says, tell John Mark to come and see him. It's amazing how, 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 how God can move and use us if we keep pressing on. And, and so I'm encouraging you, you gotta forget the things that are behind. Don't, sometimes the things that are behind are keeping us because, you know, I remember the glory days of High Street. 
when everybody in the city used to come to High Street. And we, to hear you guys tell the story, you would think High Street was the only church in Philadelphia. Because the glory of High Street made you feel like you were the only church in Philadelphia. And, and everybody was coming. And Scott, I can remember the Simpsons. I can remember Alan. I can remember this person. I can remember Betty. And then Betty and Alan got going. Woo! Church took off. But you got to forget those things too. Because sometimes, because you can remember Betty and Alan, poor Pastor Dave, it's like, oh, well, he's trying. <laughs> I just want you to know that you got to look forward. The good things and the bad things from behind. you got to forget what's behind. That's, that's exactly what Paul says. And straining toward what is ahead. Not looking ahead. Straining. I mean, that, that conjures up an action of great effort on your part. You're not just walking ahead. You're not just cruising on, because a lot of people also like to get to a certain speed and cruise. I took a trip just last, this past week, and when I got to my speed, I pressed cruise. That's all fine and dandy when you're on the road, but there's no cruising for heaven's road. All of you who've got this special trick odometer that you can press cruise and you think it's going to take you to heaven, I want you to know pressing cruise means you're not going any further. Because not only forgetting what's behind, but you've got to strain forward. You can't strain forward in cruise. Say stop cruising to glory because you might miss it. Your nobody has attained to the point where you can cruise. I know Brother, Brother Savage is not here, so I can say this. I admire Tom Brady. I admire Bill Belichick. When they are ahead, they press and crush and score more points and let the rest of the world say they're piling up on them. And I say, go ahead and pile up. I just wish the Eagles, when they get a 24 point lead, will stop putting it in cruise. Because while you're cruising, the other team is catching up to you. There's no cruising for victors. If you are going to be victorious, you can't cruise. You've got to fight all the way to the end. That's why the Bible, the Psalm that we say says, press the battle on. Forward, forward, upward, onward. Listen to the words of that song. Nothing about that is cruise. Don't fight so that you can get to the place where you can cruise. No, you're always straining. You're always reaching. You're always wanting to go further for the glory of God. So this verse says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press I press, don't forget press. I continue to apply steady pushing. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. High Street, are you pressing on? I don't mean the old good old church saying, how are you doing this? I'm pressing on. <laughs> Not that press. That's no press. No, I'm talking about you are applying constant pressure, straining, steadily pushing. That's what I'm talking about. Or have you got to a place where you figure, I'm old enough now, seven of us in the 90s, we're going to just let the wind of those behind us push us into glory. You know, 90s is no reason to put it in group. Sorry for you 90 year olds, I expect you to press. And those of you who don't even know what press means, I expect you to press too. We gotta learn what pressing is, we gotta stay firm and focused, and we gotta keep looking towards the price, towards the goal. There's a special goal that God has put before us, 
and the, the whole thing is, is glory, right? The whole thing, we all want to get to heaven. And we say what a day of rejoicing that will be, but it will not be a day of rejoicing for everybody. It's only a day of rejoicing for those who enter in. And it's only there for rejoicing for those who keep pressing. Forward, onward, and upward. That's the battle cry. That's what the Lord wants us to do. That's where the Lord wants us to be. So saints of God, I encourage you today. Keep pressing on. Keep pushing. Keep praying, keep toiling, keep working, keep on for glory. And if you haven't started, start doing it. Because the only way you're going to make it is by pressing on. Press on to that price. And then, in some day, some glorious day, we will all rejoice. We will all be excited, we'll all be happy because we won't be heaven bound, we will be in heaven. Amen? May God bless you and keep you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word has gone forth and we know that according to the power that you have, it can never return for you. We pray right now that the hearts of those who have heard your word will move the feet of those that they can do what your word says. Yes. That we'll be willing to go where you say to go, to do what you say yes. to do. Bless us and anoint us and encourage us and inspire us, we pray. Amen. 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 As we look into close, we want to always invite those who the Holy Spirit is, is pushing to come and and find a way to get closer. You haven't yet arrived, you haven't yet attained, but you can get closer to that place. If there's anyone who has felt the leading of the Holy Spirit today that says, you know, I may have just, I may have just pushed it in cruise. Let me take off the cruise so that I can control and push more. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my sister. Come, let's pray with you. The, 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 the time is now. You know, the Holy Spirit's moving. While the Holy Spirit is moving, that's when you jump on board and let the power of the Holy Spirit catapult you into where you. That's where you can press on. Press on. Yes, Lord. To anyone else, the Lord is saying, I want to press on through you and I want you to press on to that goal that I have for you. Press on, press on. Thank you, sister. If you can't get up here, you raise your hand. Praise the Lord. We will pray with you and for you. Yes, Lord. We got to press on. There's a world out there that needs us to press on so that we can reach them, so that they can learn who the Lord Jesus is, so that they can know that he actually died for them, so that they can know that their sins have been forgiven, yeah. and that they have a place in heaven. Yes. Yes. Amen. Join us as we pray for those who are standing here. Father, we thank you for our brother and our sisters that are standing at your altar, and by standing, and also the one who's sitting, who raised her hand, or indicating, Lord, I want to be used of you and I want to keep pressing on. I want to not stop, not look to the right or the left, not slow down, not take my foot off the pedal, but I want to keep pressing on. And Lord, we pray that your power now will come upon these individuals, that they will receive your Holy Spirit, who will give them the grit, give them the, the ability to carry on, to press on, to hold on, to strain forward. We thank you, Lord, that they're committed, that no matter what, what they have to push through, no matter what, what weights they're 
are trying to hold them down, Lord, that they will lay aside any weights that we find them. They will let go of anything that's holding them back so they can reach that goal. Lord, 